Hello. Welcome to Security, Cryptography, Whatever. I'm Deirdre. I'm David. I'm Thomas. And we have a special guest today, which is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Hi. And David, I think we're talking about security audits today. <laughs> we're going hard on the whatever. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, since it's audits, this is clearly the whatever and not the security or cryptography parts. Uh, but before we get into that, I just want to take one opportunity to say that um, a year ago on this podcast, I was right because there was a matrix bug <laughs> and I was just like, the one time. I was like, yeah, just one time I've been right. I was like, wow, this protocol seems like it's really weird if this type of bug can exist in it. And I think I said it was not just a straight like sender ID to AEAD key lookup. And uh, lo and behold, there go. <laughs> there's some bugs um, that we're not going to talk about today. But I just I just wanted to do a little self validation here, make it feel like I know what I'm talking about. You want to call it on Matrix being a steaming crater? Um, on the Matrix protocol being being not what you want, <laughs> not what you want. What was the bug? A year ago? Do you remember? Yeah, uh, some sort of like you could change out the key from underneath people. I don't remember. But anyway, that's a topic for a future podcast. W what's the topic for this podcast? The topic for this podcast is SOC 2. Um, ah. so set or security <laughs> security through rules, we'll call it. So to set the stage for this, Thomas has done a bunch of writing about SOC 2, some of which I've kind of followed because I've done... Aspects of SOC 2 at two different startups of various stages in the last three years. And Thomas, you did SOC 2, I assume, for a plethora of startups when you were doing, I don't know if I'm, it's cooth to call it consulting at Laticora, but consulting. And so let's talk about the, the Laticora SOC 2 starting seven that you wrote a few years ago. Sure. So in like 2016, me and my wife, Aaron, and Jeremy Roush from Matasano started a company called Latacora. And Latacora runs whole security teams for startups. Um, so me and Aaron were at Latacora for about four years. And during that time, when, I was, when, when we were there running security teams for startups, when people would call in you know, as prospects, as people we potentially work with, we'd ask them, like, what are the reasons they're calling in? And we heard SOC 2 a lot. It was like a major driver of people reaching out for kind of consulting help, which is kind of what put it on my radar to begin with. We're running a consultancy. We're trying to, like, get people to, you know, let us work with them to build a security team. And one of the big, thing that, the big things they want is SOC 2. So I should probably pay attention to what SOC 2 is. And then, like, over time, over the four years that I was there, I had the experience of working with a couple of different companies as they went through their SOC 2 process. I'm like like peripherally familiar with kind of formal audit stuff. Like PCI is probably the best example of something I had exposure to before. And like like everybody else that is familiar with kind of like standard PCI security audits, I have contempt for them. And I had like roughly <laughs> the same kind of take on SOC 2. Like I kind of figured SOC 2 is going to be roughly the same sort of terrible thing. And it's it turns out it's a different terrible thing. <laughs> it's it's not the precise terrible thing that I thought it was going to be. So like it, the weird thing is like you know we have this first client that we're going to do you know an actual SOC two project with. We're going to actually be the technical support for a real SOC two, and we're all nervous about like you know what we have to be ready for and all the ducks that we have to you know have in a row for the SOC two auditors. And then like we go through their SOC two and the, like we have these calls with these auditors and they're just taking screenshots, which is like you know, I think I think everybody notices. And like I like I, I noticed that like we were explaining things to our auditors that I wouldn't have expected to explain to a security huh. auditor. Like like what is an IP address? <laughs> or what what is what is a URL? Um, like literally like the, the, like they were going through log lines this is not us this is not like this is like one of my clients um who shall remain nameless but like their auditors like th they take a screenshot of all these like log lines and the log lines are obviously like they're http logs right like here's the url yeah. somebody was hitting and, and we're like okay well if you look there at the url you can see and like well i'm gonna stop you right there what do you mean by the url right it's like uh, so, so, okay it's okay like, okay I, I don't shit about fuck about security audits of this sort. I know about a person who writes code looks at like a cryptographic specification and they look at the code you wrote and they tell you yes. where you either did or did not implement the thing you were supposed to or where you made an error when you're doing it. I know about that kind yes. of audit. 
what is this kind of audit and who are the people doing the audits if they don't know what these things are that you're telling me? <laughs> Here's the mistake you have made. The thing you're describing where somebody looks at a piece of code and finds, you know, looks and sees if there's problems in the piece of code, that's not an audit. Oh, right? I like see. in the rest of the world, like in the rest of the universe, yeah. that is like that thing you're describing is not called an audit. Okay. An audit is by definition, according to the official rules of accounting, you know, all the accounting standards, like like the actual textbook definition of an audit is a process conducted by somebody who doesn't know what a URL is. <laughs> I mean, you, you can also like make the analogies like the same as getting your taxes like audited, right? Or like whatever situation audit. You buy an okay. Audit okay. So like, so like if you like, think of it from like the bookkeeping perspective, it's like oh, bookkeeping and we've taken it to security. Yes. And actually, you can see from a lot of the auditors too, right? Like you, you see that bookkeeping like background coming in. Which is why they end up being like, hold on, what's a URL? <laughs> and I, I'd be a little careful, right? Like, um, it's funny to put it the way I, I think it's funny. To, I think it's funny to put it the way I just put it. But um, I, I like our auditors at my current company a lot. I would have to say that, wouldn't I? But I, <laughs> I, 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 do, I, I do really like our auditors, right? They're not super technical. And I think that's like the most important thing if you're not familiar with SOC 2. Like, okay. if I was going to like take a random security person and bring them up to speed on SOC 2 and pick just a couple of things to say, right? The very first thing I would say to them is get rid of whatever notion you had of what kind of person is doing this audit and how much like background they'll have on your engineering replace that completely right like <laughs> these are really more like accountants their practice kind of arms them with like a list of kind of high level things like they have a playbook on things they're looking for and those can get into some engineering detail but like they don't have first principles understanding of that okay. detail right they have a first principles understanding of accounting for sure of what an actual audit looks like and how to like you know reconcile documentation how to do samples and things like that like the audit part of it they've got down right but the engineering stuff, they'll have a lot of engineering detail, but none of it is first principle stuff. So like we had that experience and it's like, you do a couple of those and then you hear people talking about SOC 2 and what you have to do to be ready for SOC 2. And it's like, well, I have an answer for that, right? Like I've been through that a couple of times. So we wrote a blog post. It was mm. called the SOC 2 starting seven, which was like our kind of like Joel test type post, like do these seven things to get ready for SOC 2. And it was a really short list. And I think the moral of that post was the things you need to do to get ready, the technical things you need to do to get ready for SOC 2 are things you should generally just be doing anyways. You know, set up protected branches in Git so that no mm -hmm. one's, you know, pushing directly to master, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that seems like a really small thing, like not a major security thing. Like, maybe you're not doing it, but like turning it on is not that, like it's not a huge project or whatever, right? But it's like most of SOC 2 is that kind of stuff. In fact, of all the things we've done at my current company for SOC 2, protected branches is the thing that was most disruptive. It's between that and single sign-on, and you're pretty much there. I would bet that any company, any company trying to get a SOC 2 audit that has SSO enabled for most of their applications and protected Git branches, no matter what other decisions they made, they could get a SOC 2, no problem. Nice. And, you know, if I'm picking a person at random and trying to bring them up to speed on SOC 2, there are other things that I would tell them. I have to think like, probably my second thing would be to question why they're getting SOC 2 and to talk yeah. about when you should get SOC 2. Because I feel like people do it way too early. I think the, the point at which you do SOC 2 is the point at which you're literally forced to do it. Where the cost of doing SOC 2 is substantially less than the deal you will close immediately when you can give somebody a SOC 2 report. I see. And that's, <laughs> and that's deceptive, right? Because you can get a long ways just by promising people you'll eventually do SOC 2. So it's not the point at which you're doing conditional POs on SOC 2. It's the point at which you literally have to have SOC 2 done okay. is the point at which you should do it, right? So you hear about like, you know, five person companies that are SOC 2 because it's getting easier to do SOC 2 or whatever, right? And like, you know, if I, have to pick, if I have to pick a second thing, yeah, if I'm picking a second thing, it's, you know, finding those people and shaking them by the shoulders and saying, stop, don't do it. <laughs> stop well, it. <laughs> as, as somebody who got a SOC 2 certification um, or did most of it at like a five person company before uh, before I went to Google, why did you do the, that? <laughs> the cause of that is you, like, we were in the, like, consumer identity space. So we had, like, PII. So uh... people were more willing to ask us about it. And then the other problem is because of, well, I don't know about problem, but because of companies like SecureFrame, companies like Vanta, that automate a lot of the checking of compliance with SOC 2, in terms of like how your cloud and, and uh, SaaS 
products are configured, the bar to do it is is arguably much lower than it was before. I'm sure that y'all at Laticora were very efficient at doing at it, doing SOC 2, but in terms of like people that hadn't been doing primarily security for startups or hadn't specifically done SOC 2 before, you know, it's still it was still a bit of a lift, even if you were trying to follow best practices. And then the existence of those companies makes checking a lot of the boxes and coming up with the evidence that you would provide to auditors um, a lot easier. And so because it's easier to do then people expect it earlier. (laughs) Yeah, it's just let's be clear, right? It was easy for us when I was consulting to do SOC 2 technical support for our clients, right? That was very simple. Doing SOC 2 is a lift, right? It's just that we weren't the people that had to do the lift. So like, mm-hmm. there's, a, there's a shitload of like just stupid paperwork that you have to do of just like business fundamentals. Remember, it's an audit in like the conventional sense of an yes. audit. So like your financials and your company documentation comes into it, right? We didn't do any of the real SOC 2 work. We just did the almost non-existent security technical work that supports SOC 2. Yes. And you need to do things like make sure everybody has acknowledged and signed that they're like employee handbook and the update process for the employee <laughs> handbook and send everyone through security awareness training, which, you know, depending on how you read it, could just be asking every employee if they're aware of security uh, That's correct. And, and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I guess like, you know, we have Sarah on the podcast with us and we brought Sarah in because we like Sarah and also because <laughs> David went around looking for people that had opinions on SOC 2 that may or may not be completely in conflict with mine. So that was like a shotgun blast of random SOC 2 stuff for me. But I'm curious what Sarah thinks about what I've said so far. So... A lot of the elements of what you said that I agree with in that there are probably a bunch of companies that are getting into SOC 2 more, too early and maybe they don't need to do it. And is it really like a good indicator for what you should be doing from a security perspective for a company, especially for a startup? I can provide a different perspective of how I experience SOC 2, which is primarily through like doing vendor security evaluation, of which I did quite a ton in the previous role. It turns out, yes, if you are SOC 2, you want a lot of your vendors to also be SOC 2. But we found in, in terms of giving out as part of, so I'll go in and take a step back and explain like the whole vendor security process. You know, you go in the process for engaging with a, a third party vendor, right? For some kind of SaaS thing or service or software or what have you, mm-hmm. right? You have a few different elements. You have the financial element is like, okay, all the invoicing, what is the pricing, whatever. You have the legal perspective, like uh, when is the contract, any certain kind of NDAs do you want mm-hmm. to do, especially now with GDPR things, do you, do you need to have some kind of protection of data privacy agreement as well? Uh, and then the third part is like, do we have some certainty that this vendor is just not going to fuck up with all yes. of our data once we send it? And as soon as we send the data, it's all going to go on the wide open internet. And it turns out when you're engaging with a wide variety of vendors, right? You have this like extreme broad like spectrum of the type of companies that you're dealing with. You have on the one hand, Google, where you say, hey, fill out a vendor security questionnaire. And they're like, are you fucking serious? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) This is, and like every single like comment in that vendor security form, it has just this light amount of snark that it's just like, I can't believe you're asking us to do a vendor security questionnaire. (laughs) And then you have the other end of the spectrum where you submit one and it's like, hello, I'm a grad student doing some data analysis and I don't know what encryption is and I don't know what like data, secure data at rest or secure data in transit or any of the terms are. I don't know what data segregation is. I don't know how to do login securely. And so you're like, okay, Mm. what what, what is like our minimum bar and how do Mm. we ensure that there's some kind of validation we can do? It would be nice if we had, you know, through a whisper network, which does way, may or may not exist, of like, is this company likely to be half decent at security in such settings? And if they don't have a SOC 2, it's fine. But when you're dealing with like reading a lot of vendor security requests and trying to figure out what's going to make sense and what's not going to make sense, hmm. it's way easier to just be like, are they SOC? Do they have a SOC 2 type 2? Got it. And if the answer is yes, it's like, okay, they're probably somewhat got their shit together. (laughs) Like enough that they're not high up on our list of vendors to worry about Mm -hmm. in the the event that there's like a data leak somewhere. 
Okay. Well, there's like a there's there's like a lot of funny stuff in that, right? Like I I, I get exactly where I was. Yeah, you know, I'm not shooting anything you just said down, right? But like I mean, you can't. I would not care. That's why we're on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, of course. So like. You mentioned like if somebody has a SOC 2 type 2, they probably have their, you know, their shit at least somewhat in order, right? So like in SOC 2, there is this notion of a type 1 and a type 2. Okay. Um, and it's not complicated, the difference between the two of them. A type 1 is a point in time thing. You you oh. essentially can't flunk a type 1 mm-hmm. because the type 1 is just a document saying, here's what you were doing at this point in time. Now, like there's a set of things you're supposed to have up and running when you get your type 1, like mm-hmm. basic access control and a security policy in place. Like I guess you, you wouldn't get a type one if you, for some reason, refuse to have a security policy. Then you'd have a problem, right? But for the most part, it's like they come in, they say, you need these things. And I'm like, I only have three of these things. And they just say, like, here, use these templates. And now, boom, you're type one. So you can't flunk it. The type two is the same subject matter as the type one. It's the same audit. But the type two is backward looking. So what they do is they're like, you know, if you say, you know, we have documented onboarding, offboarding procedures for all of our employees, right? When they do the type two, they're going to say, OK, well, give me, you know, three random people that you offboarded in the last year and then show me the documentation for how you offboarded them. Mm -hmm. And if you can't show that documentation, you get like a variance or whatever, you get some demerit in your SOC 2 type 2 report, which ostensibly people look for, right? So that's type 1, type 2. Type 2 is obviously the harder one to do because they actually look to see if you were consistently doing stuff. But it's the same stuff, right? So the the first thing I I would say there is that my understanding, we talked to a lot of people about SOC 2, both when we did the consulting article that I did a couple of years ago and more recently when at fly.io we started a SOC 2 process got our type 1 and all that stuff right and several very clueful fairly large pretty sophisticated security teams that I talked to had no problem taking type 1 reports from people right one very sophisticated very excellent very strong team has a vendor that gave them five consecutive type ones <laughs> just they never which by the way if you're listening to this podcast and you have to do something with sock 2 like the cheat code i just gave you is pretty powerful right <laughs> like anybody can pass a type 1 there's no work for it you don't have to prepare for it right <laughs> and you can give you know other people's vendor sec programs consecutive type 1 reports mm-hmm. and it'll be fine right mm-hmm. so to all that i would just say like if, if we're saying like you know, SOC 2 set some kind of bar. Does it set a bar? Yeah. <laughs> we were joking right before we, we kind of went on the air about how, like, one of the impetuses for this is, like, everyone like, everyone's on a security team, everyone's vendor sec dream is that they'll write a single master questionnaire. And then when people come in asking, like, can you please fill out this stupid vendor questionnaire, right? Like, you'll, uh, you know, here's our master questionnaire that we mm. are pre-prepared for. You're all set. And no one takes that, right? That's the running yeah. joke in the industry is, like, you can spend the time doing that, but people won't accept it, right? But like, if it's between a SOC 2 type 1 report, or a SOC 2 type 2 for that matter, and a pre-written master questionnaire, both of those seem to convey the same value to me. Assuming that the questionnaire is like, fill that competently. I might push back even on that, right? I think if you have enough clue to know that you should have a master questionnaire, it might not matter to me. <laughs> That's true. Like, if, if you have enough foresight to be like, I should pre-prepare some questions that people, that are about in the shade that people are going to ask me and just straight up answer those questions. You're probably ahead of the game more than most people who, when given a question, I was like, I've never had to do one of these before. I'm just kind of YOLOing these answers and hoping for the best. And so you were in a vendor sec program and you were reviewing like this kind of documentation before. Yes. Okay. So I have a question for you. All right. When we were doing our type one fairly recently, right? One thing that we ran into, we, we're, um, we're a distributed team. Everyone's remote. We have people kind of all over the world. We have a bunch of developers in like sub-Saharan Africa. Like we have just people everywhere, right? And one of the things that SOC 2 wants you to do is background checks, um, hmm. which is like one of the things auditors know to ask for is have all of your employees been criminally background checked, right? And if you have employees in like France, you can't background check them. It's a, it's yeah. illegal in France to do that as an employer, right? So like, and th- good job, France. <laughs> <laughs> the auditors know that they're like, oh, there's a, there's a bunch of language we'll use for like, you know, your U.S. employees are background checked, but like your uh-huh. you know, European employees won't be or whatever. And like, you read that, and your natural response is like, well, fuck that shit, right? Like, why am I letting the French people off the hook, right? Like, <laughs> if the French people don't have to be background checked, then none of our U.S. employees are too. Yeah. Which was the, the, the tack we took with it, right? And I asked a bunch of people if you 
got a SOC 2, like the the auditor's response was, it wasn't that they wouldn't give us a type one without background checks. It was, well, people are going to look at this type one report or these, these type twos that you give them and see that you don't background check and they're going to push back on it, right? And I asked a bunch of people about this and no one really seemed to care. So I No guess one the, the actually bro- looked at your, your SOC 1. Yeah. So that's my broad question, right? Like, so Sarah, when you're, when you're looking at these things, are you looking carefully at what they, I, I don't know, like, because you're, you're dealing with lots of them. Like, how careful yeah. are, do you think that the typical vendor stack program, you're doing everything, you're reading absolutely everything. I believe that 100%, right? But if you had to guess the typical vendor stack program, are they even looking at the report? I think it depends on what they focus on. So there's a lot to tease out of, out of this question of like, like in terms of, you know, you've got a company that's giving out, asking the the third party providers that they, they want to work with, like giving out these like questionnaires. I think a little bit of, of background and context setting is for this company that is setting out questionnaires, like what kind of company is it for it to really care on the responses from the report? Because one of the things that I think is, is hard to tease out is I think a lot of people in the security industry understand like background checks can be kind of nonsense, right? Like there's a lot of people from a variety of backgrounds that like this is just simply not fair for them to be held back because something bad has come up as part of a background check. But separate to that, there are companies that are held to specific standards relating to like, especially if it's like a financial company, Mm -hmm. like there are certain government regulations that are in place that simply say you need to have done due diligence and background checks on all of your employees. Otherwise, these employees cannot work at your company, mm-hmm. right? And those might be companies that also like, either they have like a, a blanket exception for someplace like France, or maybe they don't, but just they specifically don't hire in France. So like that kind of background check requirement may be useful. It happens to be useful in a SOC, SOC 2 report, but it might be that the person or the like security team that is like, Dealing with that, they don't really care to check about that too much. And they care for the background check from the perspective of this is a financial company that is subject to other regulations. And from that perspective, like the legal team is going to really care about it. But like from the security perspective, we don't care. We're, we're mostly caring about like, is the data going to be secure? Does it seem like they have a good understanding of how their environment is set up? Do they have a good understanding of how security works in their environment? Do Can we trust them that like, data is going to be actually secured properly and handled properly and not going to be got onto the wide open internet. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes, that makes perfect sense. Right. I guess like my, my mental model there is the SOC 2 is a thing you get to get past, like call it procurements or like, you know, kind of mechanized vendor sec where it's like, there's no conversation to really be had with some of these companies. You just have to have a SOC 2 or they're, you're not going to get through their vendor sec process. And then at the point where somebody's like, well, we really care that your employees are background checked. That's a conversation you have with like your head of security on one end of the phone and their head of security on the other end of the phone. Yeah. And you, ha- you hammer something out that goes in the PO where you make a specific commitment, like the employees that touch my data will be background checked or something like that. Right. Yeah. And I don't know specifically about background checks, but there are, you know, having worked at a couple places where like the buyer was a security team um, or might be a security team. There are situations where if the buyer is a large enough company that can kind of throw their weight around a little bit, (laughs) but might even be that they will find things to complain about simply as a way to exert power over the other person because they get their willies from it and Hmm. that this is like reasonably common and sometimes this will pop up like reasonable concerns it's like the classic the the onion heartbreaking the worst person you know made a great point type situation but other times they'll just be looking for things to complain about and in that situation i think you know complaining about a background check would might be just something they could complain about and then you do exactly what you said and then the people that wanted to complain get to complain and you get to continue not doing background checks. <laughs> Even if you had done everything to the T, like some people will still find things to complain about. So you may as well take an opinionated stance. That's my opinion. Yeah. So Sarah, you've done larger scale vendor sex stuff than any of the rest of us. I've done like a very little bit of it, but not like a huge amount. Right. So I guess like the burning question for me is, so I get to choose kind of what goes in my SOC 2 report. Like I get to, you know, kind of choose the controls. The the rough like outline of a SOC 2 is like they have high level kind of access control. Right. And like, so they they have like this kind of goal, like Mm -hmm. the security goal of like you have some access control and you have controls that are mapped to that goal. And you could, you could roughly kind of pick what those controls are. Right. So are there specific things? 
things. Like, this is the big question I have about this whole thing for people that do vendor stack is like, if I get to pick which things I'm going to do in order to satisfy this, like which controls I'm going to actually implement and claim in my SOC 2, do you care? Like, what are the specific <laughs> things I, uh, w- what are the parts of the report that you're looking at carefully? I bet you, you're going to hate my answer because it's going to really be like a million, it depends kind of situation <laughs> here. We're not going to look at it like super closely. If say there's no like customer data going into it, like, I, I don't know, like a hypothetical example here is like, say some manager is like, uh, you know, it's the pandemic. I want to do like some kind of offsite. I'm going to engage this vendor call, like a uh, gather town to host like some weird offsite. Like, are we really going to dig through into the SOC 2 report and see how access control is done? If it's just going to be like, 10 employees playing a board game virtually <laughs> no like it does not make any sense yeah assume they're getting your google auth tokens like serious like a, like oh. hardcore yeah so like for for more serious stuff we would look really carefully and and see like i think the thing that we mostly take a look for is I, this is really weird to say but it's like does it sound like they know what they're talking about do the sentences they like are the sentences they're putting in this report do they make factual sense or are they completely nonsensical, right? And we've had cases where people write stuff, like write a bunch of, of sentences hoping to kind of, quote unquote, pull the wool over our eyes. But it turns out in, in the situation where I was reviewing vendor security questionnaires and reports and what have you, um, we had security engineers doing it. So we could spot from like a mile away that this was clearly some people putting some buzzwords into a sentence and hoping <laughs> that it would it would pass through. And then that would be where we would actually, if it wasn't clear from that report and we were dealing from with super, super sensitive information, we would actually go and try and hop on a call to be like, can we get someone who is like not a director and not a salesperson, but like an actual engineer to explain this to us? And then we would kind of do a, a check that way. That yeah. was really rare to do because it was extremely time consuming. And it turns yep. out they really don't like you trying to get hold of one of their engineers. <laughs> but the companies that did allow like us talking directly to their engineers, they were often the best to work with, it turns out. I don't out, know, man. It- like, I would take it gladly. If we have a customer that wants to talk to me and I'm a security engineer or even just an engineer, I'd be like, hey, I like you, customer. You actually <laughs> give a shit. <laughs> that is what? not the common reaction. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. like finding time on my calendar. Are you but sure I would... you're not a product manager? Like, no, I, I don't know, man. I like people who care about good security. You're no longer allowed to talk to customers. I've demoted you from the talking to yeah. customers. <laughs> I like... think it's great when people like want to do that, but I, I don't think that's the common reaction. <laughs> It's, it's it's not that like actually I I kind of I'm I'm weird I I actually sort of enjoy filling out questionnaires because like I'm a preening asshole vulnerability researcher type so it's like I think I know <laughs> I think I know better than everybody that wrote those questionnaires to begin with so I can just go like we can see your kind of responses in the questionnaire yeah. like responses and we're like this guy knows what the fuck he's talking about no. for sure look at how <laughs> look at how proud he is of simply everything and like the amount of mm-hmm. detail and how he's talking about certain standards are. Right wrong and we're using <laughs> this standard and i was like yep this guy certainly is on podcasts and he reads like the latest and greatest like we can tell from a mile away <laughs> yeah this is the that's the, the nice way of putting all of that stuff <laughs> And I like doing those calls for the same reason. It's just an opportunity to preen, right? But like lots of people want that that contact, right? Lots of people want to talk to a security engineer and get like, you know, warm fuzzies about what you're doing. But like where the rubber hits the road is what things people need in order to make a purchase. And the only people that need that contact to make a purchase have a crap load of money. Right. Like it's almost guaranteed if like if they need to take your SOC 2 report and then get on the phone with an engineer to confirm it, then they are price insensitive, right? And so like, if you know that about a customer and you have a convenient way of actually applying a charge to a price insensitive customer, then you do it, right? Like, so, so like at the point where somebody's reaching out and saying, you know, can I talk to a security engineer to, you know, get some details about the software report? I guess like you, my eyes are lighting up too. It's just that my eyes are lighting up with dollar signs. In them, so. <laughs> I will not, I think that was a problem we did face later down the road where I mean, we, we ran into some situations where I'm like, you would pass the security check and then we would go into the negotiation phase of like the, the money. And actually, I think it, it depended. We, we changed the program like a couple of times. There were a few times where we locked in like what the, the price contract was likely going to be. And then it got hung in security. 
uh, or in, in a vendor security uh, assessment. Um, and then that's where it fell. And we've had the other way around where like people were like, well, vendor security is taking way too long because they really want to talk to every single person, every single security engineer at every single company, apparently. And so then they would kick that up and then it would get later get hung over in, in the like negotiation contract phase where it's like, oh, this company has interpreted the intent the zeal of this, the, the buyer uh, from the security perspective as a, apparently a blank check. <laughs> and we have therefore screwed up in the process. <laughs> like from what you said about, you know, for a sensitive you know, vendor or whatever, you, know, you look fairly carefully at the SOC 2 report. And then if you have concerns, you set up a call, right? That makes sense to me. And my takeaway from hearing that process is that I should never sweat what is in my SOC 2 report. I shouldn't worry about it ever, right? Because the worst case is I'm just going to wind up on a phone call that 80% of the time I'm going to end up on the phone with anyways, right? Yeah. Like, so it's it's like you're not going to bomb out of, you know, a procurement or something like that over vendor sec just because of literally what's in your SOC 2 report. You're just going to yeah. have one extra call. Okay. Yeah, you're going to have one extra call. Let, let's put it this way. Like, like, if you just fill out the questionnaire and there's no SOC 2, we'll probably ask you for a call. But basically, like, if we're asking you for a call, there's there's a hidden perverse incentive on our side, which is we're getting the big signal that someone really wants to purchase this vendor, right? Or someone really wants to, to move forward with this agreement because we have already tried pushing button. Like, this is really alarming or, like, this is not, like, at the standard we want. Are you really sure we want to move forward? And they're like, well, what's the concerns? And we're like, well, these are the concerns. They don't have enough information on this. And then we'll be like... Uh, and then they'll be like, why don't you get more information? In which case, now we're, we're doing the call. And then it turns out maybe, like, we've had situations where it's like, the salesperson has filled out the vendor questionnaire. <laughs> the salesperson has sent us a document that is really just a PDF with a picture of a SOC 2 badge on it <laughs> and sent that to us, <laughs> which is absolutely not a great indicator of, like, what we actually, or not really good information what we need whatsoever. And so sometimes it's just us prodding to be like, can we get someone who has more engineering and security context to provide us the actual information we need in order to make a valid assessment? We're definitely treating a lot of potential vendors in extreme good faith, maybe more than necessary. <laughs> um, but that is because, at least on the team that I worked with, um, we really wanted to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. And we knew that there were many companies that were like the traditional big companies that like maybe did have everything sorted out, but feature wise, they were not. There was like some things missing that our team, uh, our teams wanted. And so they weren't exploring new vendors. We also were fairly aware of the fact that like when you're a small scrap and startup, the only way you get into the well-known company phase is by getting more customers. <laughs> and there's like de definitely different phases to that evolution, right? And so you may not have all of the things that the other companies have yet. And we're willing to give you that chance to kind of build up so that, you know, you, you're now actually competing with every, everyone else on, on a fair game. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think anyone actually like thought that way, but it's certainly like we engage with a lot of much smaller vendors from the perspective of we simply wanted to avoid some big ones because the smaller ones seemed kind of cool. And they were not quite all the way into the level of security maturity that we would typically expect for a big vendor, mm -hmm. but maybe we could like work with them a bit more to understand their security posture and we would have enough confidence from that that everything was going to be fine. Yeah. What I'm hearing is Thomas should replace his SOC 2 report with a PDF of a Word document of Word <laughs> art that says he had SOC 2. Yes, basically. <laughs> and then he will immediately get a call because if anyone knows who Thomas is, they'll be like, Thomas, why do you have a PDF <laughs> with a SOC 2 sticker on it? So that you'll just jump on a phone call with me and we'll just skip right to it. I mean, I guess among like the big SOC 2 opinions I now have, like there's a thing in the industry called the SSO tax, which Rob Shaheen like maintains this website called SSO.tax. And it's <laughs> what it does is it spells out the price difference between like the standard account and the account that you need to enable single sign on like SAML or whatever at all these different different providers. And some of them are crazy. Like the markup is like 2000% to get into the account class where you can turn, you know, SAML on. And like the, the idea there is is that this is a tax, right? It's yeah. a tax on people for security, right? And like you can go back and forth on, you know, the validity of 
VSSO tax, whether it's like literally people putting a tax on security or whether it's, you know, the people that actually need SSO are paying for, you know, the cheap accounts for everybody else. Right. Like there's just mm-hmm. different ways to look at it. Right. But I, I can understand the argument where if you're charging people extra to have single sign on, then you're encouraging people not to do something that they need to do for security. You are kind of putting an extra cost on just security. Right. And Let's be explicit about why single sign-on is better for security for your org than having a different login for every single vendor that you use. I mean, I think all four of us are, will probably agree. You can't run for a, for a serious company, you know, of any real size um, without some kind of single source of truth for, you know, identity and authentication. You, you right. can't run that. It'll just be crazy. You'd like a single place to, you know, turn people's access off when they leave yes. and, you know, set policy for who can access what. Um, the big one is like you, you want a single place where you can enforce, you know, phishing proof, you know, multi-factor, you know, authentication, right? Like yeah. if everything is single sign-on and the single sign-on does, you know, web auth, then you're kind of done right like just mandate it and then you know move on and if you're managing like 300 different vendors and you know trying to make sure they all support web off and just give up it's not going to yeah. work we we definitely for a lot of our vendors we would go ahead and ask like do you support sso do you support like south do you so that we can integrate with us and if they did we would say can you implement it so yeah. we can and that was often actually one of the bigger like indicators of they were not ready to yeah. like work with us because it was just like, do you know how big your company is? Do you know how many like vendors we have? It would be simply impossible to track and manually offboard every single employee at any time like someone left the company from like all these vendors at once. So that it was a deal breaker for for some vendors. And if you're if you're a product manager like David is and I was, right? Like you look at that and you say, well, what you just spelled out is the reason why SSO should cost more, right? Is because the people who need it, the people for whom it's make or break on the purchase are less price sensitive. They're larger companies. And so they don't care as much about the monthly cost of a single seat or whatever. So- I mean, sometimes we did. The, if the cost of your monthly seat, my favorite were like cost per employee per month, per day or per week. It was like all kinds of ridiculous like intervals sometimes. We would take a look at it and on the surface it would be great, but then we'd realize like maybe only 25 employees needed it. And so it's like, okay, yep. do we really want to pay it for say 10,000 people at the company? Mm. And it was like, well, now that's an enormous price difference. And that's probably a whole other discussion of like, how would we handle that with like SSL? Yeah, yeah. I've seen JIRA extensions that are like $11 per employee per month. And it's like, no, like you're just <laughs> not going to pay that to get like LaTeX and JIRA or something yeah. like that. When yeah. like eight people are going to use it and you have like a hundred or a thousand people at your company. Yeah. You have to pay me to let LaTeX be in JIRA. <laughs> but like, yeah, there's a lot but, to but, unpack from that whole statement. But, <laughs> but, but it's like, you know, it's like business class pays for the back of the plane for, for all of the rest of the people sitting in the plane right and i mean i, th- I think it's also i think it's fine to say like I, I'm, I'm kind of i'm showing some of my cards here right but i think it's kind of it's it's fine to have a set of product offerings well we've switched off of vendors here at fly because of the price to enable sso because we really need everything to be sso and like we use like maybe like they're, they're they have a suite of products and we only use one tiny little one that we like a lot but like you can only turn on us so if you opt into all the rest of the products well it's like fuck it okay we're just not gonna be able to use this anymore right mm. but i don't i don't moralize it right it's not gonna work for us we're just it's not a good package for us we're gonna you know pick somebody else and we're happy with it. We're all adults in business and this is fine, right? But like there are people that very much moralize the, the SSO tax thing, right? But I get it. I get why people moralize it. It's very important to have SSO to begin with, right? But compare that to SOC 2, where nobody needs SOC 2. Like nobody, <laughs> it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. It's not a very good standard as we've established, right? Like, and it's not going to make or break security anywhere, right? So why would I give that away for free? If you're asking for SOC 2, then you're big enough to have a vendor stack program. So like, it seems like a reasonable strategy to me is if you want to be generous about it, then you write up your own report that is basically <laughs> isometric to or isomorphic to what was in the SOC 2 report, but it's, you know, not audited, you know, but you don't, nobody cares. You're giving the same information away, give that away for free. And then if people really need to SOC 2 to file in their vendor sec program, it's like, well, you need to be in the, you know, advanced super awesome, you know, account class to get that, right? <laughs> it's, so it's, I guess that's the thing I like about SOC 2. I guess I'm realizing it's a thing I like about SOC 2 <laughs> is that it's a security feature that you can gate on, you know, an account or something like that, that doesn't take away security if you don't have it enabled. 
The problem is as as it goes down market for because of like secure frame Vanta and so on, it's no longer as good of an indicator uh, of a like oracle of does this company have a lot of money or not because it might just be five people in a shed and they might only have like <laughs> uh, a little bit of money in seed funding. Well, this yeah, this this gets back to like I think people don't push back hard enough on getting so we w- we waited a long time um, to sock to here. I still think we probably did it too quickly. If I think about it, we weren't forced to do it when we did it. We could have we could have waited. It was just like we kept getting questions about it, and we closed the business anyways. But like you know, we we're like any day now we're gonna get somebody we're really gonna want to close, and we're gonna need sock two, and then we pulled the trigger faster than we should have. And we're reasonably like compared to like the seven people in a shed or whatever, we're reasonably large, right? There's also like, I have lots of misgivings. I like the other, particularly at Vanta. There are a lot of people at Vanta that I like a lot. I don't hate anything about Vanta or whatever, but I have like deep misgivings about Vanta as a product, just in terms of like the approach that we took for SOC 2 versus the approach that I've seen people take with things like Vanta, where if you're not familiar with Vanta, Vanta is a Y Combinator company. They're like the official way, the semi-official way that every YC company SOC 2s, right? Um, Because they're all kind of in the same club together. And it manages all the evidence collection for you. So like, you know, it gives you all the checklist things like when you're doing a SOC 2 kind of on the fly, the basic process is that your auditors will give you a giant spreadsheet checklist called a DRL, the document request list. And it's just, it's like, it's basically the security questionnaire from hell and you fill it out and that's, and then they come back in and with your answers, they take screenshots to back it up and that's the whole audit. Right. And it's kind of like a pre DRL where it's like a bunch of things you fill out before you get an auditor. Yeah. And then when your auditor comes in, like they you just plug them into Vanta and they don't talk to you. They just pull things out of your Vanta. And, and part of the way that works is they install agents yeah. on your systems to yeah. like automate the, the evidence collection from your servers, which I mean, right off the bat there, that's, you shouldn't be doing anything resembling that just to get SOC 2. There could yeah. be other reasons to do agent based stuff. Right. But for SOC 2, always. that's, for SOC 2, it's like, it's, it doesn't matter how good the agent is. It's just not enough of a value prop to add an agent to things. But that's actually not my Vanta problem, right? My Vanta problem is that it pre-generates this you know, big, long list of, you know, good security things that you should be doing and filling out. But SOC 2 doesn't require almost any of that stuff, right? If you follow kind of the happy path with things like Vanta, and I'm not just talking about Vanta, there's like, this is what these products look like right now, right? They're like security questionnaires where it's like, you fill these things out and plug your evidence in. And they're basically guiding you to the the set of security things that you should get done, right? But my take is, and I, I think Sarah is backing me up on this, is that it does not matter what is in your SOC 2 report. Certainly not to the degree of granularity that Vanta is having you kind of provide evidence <laughs> for. I'm sure that's for. what Sarah wants the takeaway to be for her. Actually, that, that brings an interesting... I, so I didn't know about this product, for what oh. it's worth. But like you describing this product has very strong similarities to a lot of products I'm seeing coming out in like the privacy compliance space, where... <laughs> For a while, I was like, what is going on with all of these companies that all seem to pop up and want to install agents on everything to suck in all your data to send to the cloud and then from there generate like some kind of report? And I'm like, I understand. For for privacy? (laughs) Yeah, for privacy. Yeah. I know. I know. I just want to know that there was like one vendor I talked to who I asked, is this on prem? And the answer was, well, you connect us through like an AWS VPC. And I'm like, that did not answer my question yeah. at all. <laughs> That's <laughs> and, an orthogonal <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes me wonder if that is the new trend for all the compliances. That are, there are a lot of different companies that are kind of mm. selling this kind of tool, which is install some agents on your thing because you, you know how much you hate doing things like basic inventory and... <laughs> Things like taking screenshots and things like capturing state and then piling it all into some like system that auto generates a report because also the people hate generating the reports because it turns out every like year or half year or whatever interval you're doing this audit, your engineers have changed all of the interfaces, Yeah, <laughs> right? What? And they can't find those systems anymore. What was the like the inventory management tool that everyone had installed and then it got backdoored by a supply chain attack and it happened and it was very bad? SolarWinds. That. This is reminding me of that. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> I'm not saying that any of my concerns with Vanta are about solar. And I, like, I don't no, think. No, no, no. But just like install this thing on all of your stuff. 
just so it's easier for you to, to compile a report later. Like the irony of privacy stuff report aside, it's just sort of like, ha, 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 I mean, I probably would have had less problems if they actually offered an on-prem solution because it would be quite compelling. But like yeah. just the number of people were like, well, but we need to utilize our magical machine learning <laughs> in order to make things work. And we obviously can't give you the magical machine learning blob. We have to send it Trade into... Trade secret or some yes, crap. Exactly. <laughs> Like, yeah. as I remember it, you don't have to use an agent with Fanta. Like, you just fill out a bunch of stuff. A, like, a good motivating example of my concern is this. We went into our SOC 2 expecting to have to do kind of endpoint fleet instrumentation. Like, that's a thing we had not done before our SOC 2 was, you know, have a kind of a rigorous standard for how we instrument people's dev machines and things like that. We're better at it now, but at the time, it was a thing we expected, like, when we were planning the work that we'd have to do to get our SOC 2, like, we, we figured, okay, this is a thing where we're going to burn a couple of weeks, getting all this, like, you know, getting OS query ironed out and all that stuff. And then we went in and talked to our auditors, and they're like, well, you know what, the trend now in, you know, 2022 or whatever, I guess, yes, it's maybe, so. I'm, I've lost track of time. Mm-hmm. Um, but the trend now is that people don't do endpoint in their SOC 2s anymore. So it's like hmm. we have this stuff for like MDM and endpoint fleet monitoring in our plans. It's like, well, just strike those. It's not going to go in your report because it's not what people do anymore, right? But like if you if you go through the Vanta checklist, there's definitely endpoint stuff in the checklist there, yeah. right? Wow. And you don't have to do it. Like it's like no one's <laughs> going to bounce your SOC 2 report for not having endpoint in it because like fairly expensive auditors are telling people not to do it anymore, right? Hmm. So like my concern is, is, I mean, the agents thing bugs me, but you don't have to use the agents. But my real concern is just that people are spending a lot more time on their SOC 2 than they need to because they're following kind of these like these checklists that are not lined up with the reality of how SOC 2 actually gets used, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I suspect that they're still net saving time versus doing it themselves because they're being handheld through the process. But I think regardless of like, I, I think you're you're to some extent like it's a race to the bottom in the market in the sense that like these things are here now and they're pushing the time from founding to SOC 2, the time to SOC 2 is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And like, I'm with you that you should probably wait longer. But like, because SOC 2 is infectious, because once you're SOC 2, you have to ask for other people's SOC 2, as long as a small percentage of people start doing it earlier and earlier and earlier, like it's just going to make the problem get exponentially worse, right? So I guess my advice to you is get your price discrimination while you can. (laughs) Do you know what my favorite thing, though, about SOC 2 and all the other compliances is just that a lot of them have huge overlaps in the kinds of questions. You cannot, like, easily copy-paste the answers from one to another. That bit is infuriating. (laughs) It's all infuriating. Mm -hmm. I agree that bit is infuriating, too. I I think there are worse things than spending more time and money than you need to to get SOC 2. And one of those worst things is spending ongoing more time and money on security stuff you weren't going to do otherwise or you would have done differently that you're locked into because you had to do it for SOC 2. When we were first talking to people, when we first, like when we wrote the first blog post, right, and kind of circulated it out there, um, this is the SOC 2 starting seven post where we're just like giving you the seven basic things. Like these are the only security things you should do to get SOC 2, which I think we were vindicated on. Like I think uh, apart from the fact that you can strike mm-hmm. MDM from that list, turns out, yep, nope, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to do a lot of stuff. I think it's interesting that if you like look at that blog post and you do delete like your header and footer paragraphs that are about SOC 2 when you just look at the seven things they're all like for everything that we've just knocked on SOC 2 those seven things are all like roughly the things that I would do if I was in charge of security or engineering or both at a startup right like that's a good list of seven things to do like on Hacker News for that blog post, I would get two kinds of orange feedback for it. <laughs> the first orange feedback was SOC 2 doesn't require you to get single sign on. You don't have to do single <laughs> sign on to get SOC 2, which dramatically misses the point in one direction. And then there was the other people like, well, if these people don't take SOC 2 seriously, then they're like, you know, they're not being serious about their security programs. And like a good security program is informed by SOC 2 and gets better because they're doing all this compliance stuff, which is wrong in the other direction. Right. <laughs> so like I've talked to lots of people who are like, well, one benefit of SOC 2 is that it brings you up to speed on security stuff and it forces you to get serious about it. And it's like, I just want to slap them. Like, oh, yeah. like, false. <laughs> like Batman slap Jeff. Right? Like, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it's not making you better at security like you get better at security by taking security seriously by staffing and building a security practice but like if you're setting the template for your practice based on what your SOC 2 auditors are telling you to do they don't know what a URL is yeah (laughs) how are you if you're setting it based on Vanta or secure frame like you are going to end up doing these seven things though so 
in mm-hmm. that sense like yeah but you'll do a lot you'll do a lot of other things like you know network security monitoring stuff that no one really does mm-hmm. yeah the, the other thing too is that like this is one of those cases of like intentions versus expectation where you go in with a particular parts of soft view are, are designed with the intention of this is what the shape of a good security program at a company would look like but now we've just translated it into this checklist And so someone coming in, not having like maybe either with just like YOLO intentions or just not treating security seriously, are just going to be like, this is a checklist. I am going to go and blindly pick each thing or do each thing in isolation without better understanding of the whole. And that is the bit that is quite unfortunate and and dangerous sometimes for these audits uh, and for these like compliances is because... If you had good, like all of us here are good intention security professionals, right? We go and take a look at this and we're like... three out of the four. (laughs) We look at this and we're like, I see why this was designed this way, right? And I see why, like how this like shows all the different like major security pieces, like to the point that we have a blog post about like, these are the things you need in order to do soft two if these are just generally good security practices. But not everyone thinks that way, Right. And the trickiest bit is when someone gives you a SOC 2 report, you have to really figure out, is SOC 2 really that indicator that they're taking security seriously? Or have they just blindly treated it as like buzzword bingo or like a series mm-hmm. of checklists to blindly follow? And sometimes for some folks, that is really hard to figure out. I see. So how would we make SOC 2 if we were just redrawing the rules with no regard for anything? Like how would we make... SOC 2 more aligned with that someone is actually taking security seriously, whether that's by changing the audit process to changing technical controls to changing something about it. Like how, what would be a a, a approvals uh, or certification program that is more of an indicator that you're taking security seriously than SOC 2? Or is this as good as you can do? We're, we're probably all pretty clear at this point that the only people that we would trust to evaluate our security practices and get a good beat on whether we're doing a good job are our peers. Mm. So <laughs> what we want is some kind of, you know, peer based thing where like other people can sign off on like, you know, and if you trust my peers that I get like, you know, you know, you, that, you, you want that kind of like peer to peer trust certification thing. So it seems kind of obvious trust. to me that what, what, what you want here is the blockchain. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> Uh, uh, you really had me on a hanger as if we were going to go to GPG or to blockchain. Um. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was going to say, I, I knew exactly which direction it was going. But <laughs> yes, I was trying to figure out whether it was GPG or blockchain. It's, we want us compliance on FTs, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know that you can do a better job than what it's doing right now. Like I, to the extent that SOC 2 forces people it effectively forces people to turn on SSO and to stop letting people push directly to master, you know, and to have centralized logging, which it doesn't really, but most people are going to end up with centralized logging as a result of doing SOC 2, right? Like, to the extent that it nudges people towards doing a bunch of things that everyone should be doing, like it's doing its job, and then really doing security certification for people, I don't think anybody's ever done that effectively. I have, I have no faith in it. There was an effort a while ago, and Sarah's probably more familiar with it than I am, but there was for a while a consortium of people that were hammering out a standard security questionnaire. It had a name and a brand and everything. I forget what it was, right? But the idea was there's an industry standard questionnaire. You just fill this thing out, and then you give that to everyone. That's like That seems more credible to me than than a certification thing. I kind of like, I, I sound like I'm dunking on or I'm trying to dunk on SOC 2 auditors. I kind of like the structure that SOC 2 has where like there, there isn't a whole lot of technical subjectivity to it. It's not like a a nerd pissing match. (laughs) It's just people that know how to review and track documentation and have enough domain knowledge to to roughly know what the documents are about. And just, you know, getting people to write things down and then having those things be binding. Like, I think it works well in that sense. I just think, you know, we should be more realistic about what it means, right? Like that it's not really setting a standard for what you should be doing for security. You still have to know what you're doing for security. And the only thing that really bothers me about SOC 2 is the extent to which people that are just now trying to figure out what their security practice is going to look like and who they should hire and what those people should be doing are taking their cues from something like SOC 2 as opposed to really talking to people about what real security programs look like. I mean, I can add a little bit to that, which is that 
I had someone reach out to me recently. Uh, it wasn't SOC who specifically, it was actually PCI, who started asking me a bunch of like specific security questions about how to handle data and in order to be like compliant with PCI. And I was like, well, you're asking me enough questions that hints to me that you need someone who's thinking seriously about security to actually come on board to your startup. Yeah. And so like from that perspective of like, if they're dealing with people who are wanting SOC 2, or if they're starting to deal with like specific compliances on there, like I think one indicator of like, actually we might need someone who is more full-time on security on board. One indicator is we're way in over our head, <laughs> like trying to deal with this paperwork. <laughs> and like someone needs to come in and actually help explain to us what we need to do. Like I, I sent them like some blog posts and stuff of like, here's like some security people I know who've written like how to security for your startup. And they're like, this is way too much. Can oh, you just tell no. us the answer? And I'm oh. like, I cannot tell you the answer in a Twitter DM yeah. in the middle of a work day right now. So you need to go and find some people. Yeah, that's a big signal. It's like, no, you need to hire someone now. <laughs> yeah, so from, from that perspective, it's it can be good to force people to start thinking about hiring huh. good people for security. The, the, the key word there, the, the like word that is carrying a lot of weight is the word good. <laughs> because there are people who are in security who could be helpful, questionably so, right? And end up leading you totally down the wrong path. Uh, but you could mm. still get SOC 2 certified anyway, right? Mm. So If you're not part of the solution, there's money to be made in prolonging the problem. <laughs> wow. So everyone's right. They're both useful, but also they could be bad because See, they this don't... is what I mean. It's the worst answer I could possibly <laughs> give, which is it depends. Okay. Right? Okay. So like it's it's dependent on a bunch of different factors on like who you know, what kind of company you are, and like what mm. size you are, and like how many of the people that you're interacting with really take this seriously versus not. Yeah. Huh. I look forward to reading Fly.io's Type 2 and marking it up with a pencil next to the pool um, on my next vacation. So, Thomas, please do send it to me when you do that. Why would we Why would we ever do a Type 2? Everyone's just going to accept our repeated Type 1s anyways. Like, I don't know, that we're kind of ruining SOC, whatever good it had. Because the other thing that SOC 2 let people do um, is if you already have a security team, right, and then you have a large rest of the company that the security team occasionally battles with, then SOC 2 is also a really good club for the security team, right? Like no one knows what, what's in SOC 2, right? And if you look at like the standard DRL or a standard Vanta questionnaire or whatever, there's a lot of things in it, right? So like security can kind of pick and choose which of those, but it gives them a blank check to get a whole bunch of stuff done because the sales team really needs SOC 2 to happen. And so it's like, well, you have to do all the things I want to do because we need them for SOC 2. And I'm saying, fortunately, like, you know, the company managers that would benefit from this advice don't listen to our podcast. But if they were, <laughs> I gave them a cheat code too which is you could just tell the security people to go fuck off because SOC 2 doesn't care about any of that stuff, right? <laughs> I also just want to say before we wrap up that like, I feel like I spent maybe 10 minutes slagging Vanta and I don't I, I don't mean to do that, right? Like I, like I said, I, I like Vanta people and I also think that like, I think there's, you probably would benefit from using Vanta to get SOC 2 with the proviso that you go in knowing that you don't have to do everything that Vanta tells you by default to do. Uh -huh. Like you should have a clear idea of which security things you want to do and can do sustainably. Like when you do it, this is probably the most important bit of SOC 2 advice I have for people doing SOC 2, which is when you do your type one, minimize what you do on your type one. Absolutely restrict the scope of what you do on your type one as much as possible. Do not overachieve in your type one because whatever you do in your type one if you don't do it in your type two it's a variance or whatever they call it right like yeah. there, there's no you don't lose any points for not doing extra stuff in your type in your type one for your type two but you do lose points if you do extra stuff in your type one and don't keep doing it in your yeah. type two so like I, i'm sure vanta is probably super effective for lots of companies like it'll, it'll probably get them through stock two a lot faster and also definitely cheaper i've talked to lots of people about how the prices work out after the audit and everything and the whole thing a package of doing Vanta and then doing the audit is cheaper than what we paid for our, you know, kind of bespoke, you know, SOC 2. But whatever you do, make sure you're doing the minimum you possibly can on your first type one. You can add things in later. It's really easy to add new security controls. Very difficult to mm -hmm. take them away. Especially if you've made a mistake and you're like, that was an overly restrictive security control that yep. has made our whole engineering team hate us. <laughs> yep. I wonder if we can remove it. Oh, wait. Yep. We can't. 
the auditors will yell at us. <laughs> My advice, never say that you're going to require two LGTMs that are non-sticky on PRs. <laughs> That's a way to get everybody to oh, hate you. Oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Once upon a time, I had to do an integration between two version control systems, and I had to sync up the the uh, collect the auditing of the approvals on every patch and like all this sort of stuff and yeah <laughs> we should also add be careful about having hyperactive security engineers who really want to be part of an audit because they've never seen one before because oh. <laughs> they may also volunteer extra information that oh just causes the auditor to ask even more questions oh. because they don't know now you've mentioned something like. I, I can't think of anything smarter than like a URL. But basically, they mentioned another T phrase that the auditor is like, wait, what is that thing? Tokens. Now? <laughs> Tokens, <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> Send those engineers to go talk to the customers. <laughs> yeah, basically. The audit itself is so boring. Any security engineer is only going to do that once because once you're through it, it's like, why would I ever sit through that again? I had another thing to say and it flew out of my head. So, so let's just end here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sock two. Don't do it until the, you absolutely have to. Sock one, do the bare possible minimum. <laughs> we should have called the blog post Teenage Sock Two, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you to Sarah Harvey for coming on the podcast. And thank Sarah, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Security, cryptography, whatever, is a side project from Deirdre Connolly, Thomas Patachik, and David Adrian. Our editor is Nettie Smith. You can find the podcast on Twitter, at SCWPod, and the hosts on Twitter, at Durham Crushulum, at TQBF, and at David C. Adrian. You can buy merchandise at merch.securitycryptographywhatever.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>